All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Rebecca Wright, Director of Computer Science at Barnard, and I'm happy to welcome you here today to our computer science seminar. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Janet Pierre Humbert with us today. Uh, she is um, comes from an interdisciplinary background uh, from Harvard and MIT in linguistics, mathematics, and electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, she began her career as a member of technical staff at at and Bell Labs in linguistics and artificial intelligence research. And she later moved to Northwestern University where um, she headed a research group that used experimental and computational methods to understand the lexical systems in English as well as other languages. She joined Oxford in 2015 as professor of language modeling in the Oxford E Research Center and her current research focuses on robust and interpretable natural language processing methods, in particular ones that can handle variations across different topics, social uh, and, and co social contexts. And uh, she is highly decorated uh, as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Cognitive Science Society, and a fellow of the Linguistics Society of America. Uh, she also won the medical medal for scientific achievement of the International Speech Communication Association in 2020. And she will be talking to us today about her work on bringing time and social space into natural language processing. Janet, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the great introduction and uh, thanks to the uh, audience for being here. Um, uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, talk about some um, uh, ideas that I teach in my uh, class on natural language processing for the social data sciences and some uh, research that's been underway in my lab. Um, and uh, we are not advancing. Well, there, I'm gonna advance this way. Uh, so there, there's three parts of this talk. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about some uh, basic uh, phenomena about words that natural language processing systems um, need to be able to handle and in many cases build on because they are, systems are very word-based. Uh, then I'm going to give a, a tour of, uh, of word embedding, which I think some of the uh, people here will know about, but others might not. Uh, and then I'm going to cover some applications. So starting with words, um, human languages are really amazing compared to other animal communication systems. They have um, huge vocabularies. Uh, some estimates would have uh, uh, educated adult speakers having a mental lexicon with about uh, 100,000 uh, entries in it. That could include complex forms that have um, some idiosyncratic meanings that you need to remember. Um, and if you uh, look at um, uh, very large corpora, uh, like the Google Books corpus, uh, any extremely large corpus, you get millions and millions of words. Um, and uh, the bigger the corpus is, the more you get. You just never run out of words. Um, and so these words give us a productive encoding and decoding system uh, that makes it uh, possible to express the complex and even novel ideas. Uh, so that is a kind of foundation of human society. We can share information about things that are you know, uh, far away, distant in time, exist in alternative realities. Uh, now, uh, for people who've read The Wrinkle in Time, uh, they might recognize this as a society where there's only one brain for everybody. Um, and that is indeed the uh, premise of most natural language processing systems, which are uh, trained on one single large corpus as a as a thing that's been frozen. Okay, so um, when we we uh, I make this um, a diagram, as in the wrinkle of time, uh, where everybody has exactly the same shared brain, uh, 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 you can see that this is um, uh, well. It's just not the way things are. You know, we are we are not like that. It's um, a, uh, unrealistic and in some ways um, horrifying prospect. Um, now, if we look at words of different frequencies, and these are frequencies from the British National Corpus, uh, you'll see a, this is just an illustration of a, a result which has been um, investigated in much more depth, uh, that we have a, a, a kind of shared core vocabulary of more frequent words that everybody knows and uses all the time, like words that occur once per thousand words or once per 10,000 words. 
uh, yeah, everybody uh, who speaks English knows these words. Uh, as we get to, um, you know, once per hundred thousand. Uh, seriously, most fluent adult speakers know all of these, uh, but you might use them on more specialized occasions or something. Once per million, we finally get into ones that some people might not know. Once per 10 million, uh, you will not find a single audience in English that knows all of these words, okay? Uh, you'll be lucky if you, now so, you, you know, okay, so what's going on there? Uh, there's a couple that seem, uh, you know, very straightforward because they have parts that you recognize immediately, like uh, Fruitwood and Game Bird. People might believe they've seen this, even if they haven't. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, obsolete slang. We've got some, uh, uh, you know, things that show up in particular dialects. Uh, and then we've got uh, things that uh, re reflect a specialized uh, 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 knowledge. Uh, so this is a, a specialized uh, knowledge about computer science. Uh, this is a specialized knowledge about poisonous frogs. Okay. Okay. So you, you agree you don't know all these words, right? There is one person who knows all of them. Uh, yeah, well, me, me, now I know them all. I admit mean, I had to look up my granulifera yesterday, but now I know it, okay. So your rare words would be dominated by uh, complex words, which you can understand from their parts, various dialectal forms and, and uh, specialized vocabulary, which you might not. Uh, okay, uh, now, um, together with a couple of physicists, Eduardo Altman and uh, Adilson Mater, uh, we did a study of... Um, of uh, Usenet discussion groups at the time, one of the biggest uh, uh, freely available corpora of um, you know, natural language created by humans. Uh, and uh, uh, this was um, a, a kind of complicated study, but one point uh, that is, um, I, I wanna make here, um, we can ask whether any individual word is distributed at random across people uh, or whether it is disproportionately used by some people and uh, uh, so overused by some people and underused by other people. Okay, so this is now um, all the words um, uh, at uh, frequencies of one per thousand, one per 10,000, one per 100,000. Um, and a DU is a, um, a measure of um, uh, whether it's randomly distributed in which case it would be one, that would be your expected value under, uh, if it was randomly distributed and a smaller value means it's bunched up on some people. Okay, uh, so um, you can see that um, from the heat map that almost all the words are um, used more by some people than by other people. Um, and we ran them uh, Monte Carlo simulations and, and uh, looked at this in more depth and um, uh, this is absolutely significantly true. Uh, there's hardly any words that are used equally by everybody. Okay, so now um, uh, getting to um, variability across time. Um, the key factor here is burstiness. Uh, this is a, a technical term, uh, which goes back to uh, a uh, huge amount of work on document retrieval. Uh, so we take a baseline, uh, which is a naive bag of words model. Um, that says that words have stationary frequencies, that we have a single um, a mentality <coughs> of the entire language. So a word frequency is a permanent static fact across all time and space. Um, and this, um, and then we make word sequences uh, by just uh, taking a frequency weighted random selection one word after another. And um, I have put a, I've made a Betsy into a bag of words and I've put naive uh, eyes on her. Okay, so this is a super naive model. It is um, uh, obviously incorrect. Uh, it just gives you a, a, a icon of uh, creating sequences by a, uh, Poisson process or a unigram model. Um, and uh, in that case, you can um, analytically derive what the distribution of words in documents would be, the counting distribution, the Poisson counting distribution. Um, and um, 
the mainstay of document retrieval is uh, deviations from this, because if some word is way off that prediction, uh, that would be a pretty good uh, indicator that it is a good keyword for documents on some specific topic. Okay, huge amount of work on that. That's why document retrieval works. Uh, now we took up a, a related question, uh, which is, um, it's mathematically related, but it, it is a distinct mathematical question. And that is the recurrence time distributions. So we got, we saw the word. Okay, and now the text is ticking along and now we see it again. So that's an interval. Okay, and now that happens again and again and again. We took all the words that occurred at least 10,000 times. So now we have a distribution over all those intervals between one use of the word and the uh, next one. Um, and um, as I, we, we did look at uh, exhaustively at all 2,000 words uh, that occurred um, that often or more. Um, Okay, but here's two words that actually have the same frequency in one particular uh, discussion group, uh, which is um, one on evolution and creation. Uh, and in that discussion group, people are finding so much about theories that theory is actually as frequent as also. It occurs uh, once per 820 words, both of them. Okay, and now if we have mu is the average time between the tokens of the words, and uh, we have, a, now we're looking at time, and uh, we can analytically derive that the a probability distribution is supposed to be uh, exponential. Um, and that would be shown on this graph by the dashed line. Um, so what is it really? Um, it's these two words, theory in red and also in blue, do not fall on that dashed line. They're both off that dashed line. Um, and uh, you can see in the inset, what it looks like at very short time lags uh, and um, and then, um, you know, as you go out to the primary part of the figure, uh, you can see that uh, that uh, curve for um, um, theory is, is very bowed. It goes way below the exponential prediction, and then it's above, uh, whereas the one for also is closer. Okay, so here's some observations about that. They're not exponential. Um, in fact, they are a stretched exponential or viable distribution, which has one free parameter, beta. Uh, you can um, uh, fit that to every single word. You get unbelievably good fits. Uh, the words differ in beta, um, but there's a, a system, uh, which is uh, a word like theory, which is a topical noun, uh, has a lower beta than uh, also. And this um, affects, um, uh, they take about it. 10 words to show up, and that's because the syntax is suppressing repetitions of the same word in a, on short time intervals. Okay, uh, so now once we've got this model, uh, we can um, generate what's the likelihood of the word as seen in time. Remember, this was the recurrence time distributions. Uh, now we're just gonna run this um, uh, and, and you know, get a little uh, stretch of a random uh, run of this model. And uh, what's happening is that once you use the word, uh, the likelihood shoots up uh, and then it uh, decays. Uh, this is a hazard process. Uh, that's a power law distribution, a power law decay function, which some people argue is the uh, correct model of human memory. John Anderson had a very uh, important um, model on that. And in this little ribbon display, you're seeing how for a, a small beta, which is very concentrated, you get all these little bursts and then you get lulls uh, because obviously once it becomes more likely, then you get uh, some more uses right close together. Uh, if it's, uh, if beta is um, somewhat bigger, you know, there's still a little burst, but nothing like the same degree. Um, okay, so those are the uh, uh, key facts we're going to have to work with to build a natural language processing system. Uh, now, yeah. So you said uh, that Usenet was your data source uh, yes. for this. So did you look at individuals within that, or you, or you looked at the the interactive conversations that had multiple uh, people with the with this? Well, they all they, you get basically long threads, mm -hmm. uh, so you can uh, collate the data by thread, and we assumed a thread was a topic. Yeah. 
uh, or you can cut the data the other way and, and, and collate it by user, right? And then you have all your, uh, you know, and those have timestamps on. So that's what it's, it, it does not have a social network, which we'll get to later. Uh, it is just sliced uh, two ways on the identical same data. Okay. Okay. So, so far we took the words as completely independent from each other. Um, that's not realistic. Uh, you know, people were immediately jumping up with their questions about, uh, you know, conceptual structure and, uh, and you know, uh, you know, if one word is shooting up, wouldn't the related word shoot up? Um, and uh, that's obviously the case for topic. It's also the case for uh, when you're looking at people because, uh, word usage patterns involving people are also conceptually mediated. You know, the people with a similar, you know, who talk to each other or have a similar social identity. Um, uh, you're getting associations with, of words with uh, areas of knowledge, opinions, uh, sentiments, and stuff like that. So uh, we want to have some way of, um, of uh, treating the words as um, uh, being related to each other. Um, and so how do we overcome this problem? Uh, we would um, make use of the uh, distributional hypothesis. Uh, and here I'm going to be um, uh, taking a little tour of word embeddings uh, just to keep all the uh, more beginning people on board. Uh, so uh, first has this famous quip, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, that could be the syntax. Uh, it could be the topic. Uh, between the syntax and the topic, uh, that provides a foundation for uh, vector space representations of word meanings, uh, which are trained by statistical algorithms on word co-occurrence patterns. And once we have these vectors, um, now we have a sort of semantic hyperspace where we can define similarity. In particular, if the cosine angle between two vectors is zero, that means they're identical. Pi over two, uh, they're orthogonal and unrelated. And here is a hugely influential example of this. It's not the first example, it's not the best example, but it's a huge breakthrough in 2013 that allowed Facebook to process 100 billion words a day. Uh, so here's how Wordtebeck um, calculates word embeddings. We have our probe word, we have a shallow neural network architecture. Uh, and uh, using that, we're going to try to uh, predict words in the context. This is a tutorial example by uh, Ron shows us trying to predict three words in the context. And that's a little backwards from what you might expect, but that's how it works. Okay, so we have our one hot vector going in. Uh, we have this, uh, you know, standard shallow neural network setup. Uh, we have our uh, uh, weight matrix here, which is V by N, the vocabulary size uh, by um, N, where N is the dimensions. That we're going to use, um, and it's typically in the range of of uh, fifty to six hundred, um, and that's big, but it's a whole lot smaller than the uh, vocabulary size. And we're going to, once we've uh, trained this up, uh, uh, we're going to end up with the uh, rows of our matrix being the representation of the word uh, with that index in the vocabulary, um, and. Um, I think he uses a clever trick to uh, get this to work in an unsupervised and efficient fashion, uh, which is uh, we have our real word that we know occurred, uh, and we basically uh, create some fake data uh, by putting random words instead. Um, and now we uh, set up the whole task as a uh, trying to classify uh, the word as a real pair or a noise pair. So why does this work? Uh, so it's a shallow architecture. It has a small window on either side. Uh, but to get it to run so fast, uh, it actually downsamples the input at random by a formula based on word frequency. So this is why it's called skip grams. It's actually just skipping stuff in the input. Uh, so let's take a sentence. One sentence, which actually occurred in our materials, was the secret documents have been traced to a Discord chat room. OK, so here we have our target traced. Uh, we've got uh, two uh, super common words there. 
Uh, so those are going to be downsampled at random, uh, similar to a. Uh. So maybe the context would be have been to a, uh, or it might be secret documents, Discord chat room, whatever. Um, to get a stable embedding, you need at least 300 examples. So it's kind of building up the embedding with um, uh, this sort of um, a combination of, of uh, nearby words related to the syntax and ones related to the topic. Now, the BERT family is much more powerful. Um, that is stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. That was one of the first uh, big pre-trained language models to be distributed. Uh, it doesn't just use words, it has a coding scheme, which kind of manages to cover all the words, even if it hits new words. Um, it is in a way the opposite from skip grams because it's gonna take the context and try to predict a, a thing that was masked out. That's mass language modeling. Uh, it has a deep neural network architecture in different versions, 17 or more layers. Uh, and then it uses this uh, uh, mechanism called uh, attention uh, in transformer models to get um, effects at different time scales. So the, the uh, different layers are set to uh, have different intrinsic time scales for where they're paying attention. Uh, so you're going to end up with a representation that uh, where some of the layers are more syntaxy and some of them are more semantic-y. Um, and instead of a single vector for each word, it's going to um, uh, return um, uh, distributions over context. So each word now has a whole uh, distribution, and that is uh, good because if, um, uh, well, most obviously, if you have a, a word that has two completely different meanings, like bank the river and bank the for money, uh, you're going to end up with, with two um, sort of peaks there, and you're not gonna think that bank means uh, a sort of um, average of the semantics of river banks and money, right? Uh, so um, that is, um, you know, the family that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, totally uh, taken off and is, uh, per, you know, th that family is, is the, um, what's used in the high performing chat bots and stuff. When you say time, do you just mean distance in a document, or you actually mean sort of timestamps if you have data uh, that no, exists in the Well, the, uh, these are, uh, uh, this is a sort of pitfall here. This is time is just the sequence of words in the document. Okay. So uh, and, the original, more time and the original books. BERT was uh, trained uh, on, um, oh, absolutely huge amount. Oh, let's see, 3.3 uh, gigabytes of data, I think, so quite big. Uh, and then it uh, has this, uh, context, you have this little ticker of words. Uh, and if you were working with an n-gram model, you would never try to use a 500 word n-gram model, right? Uh, because you want to be able to get a relation between here and there that disregards everything in between, right? But it's doing that by using attention where it just is, you know, attention layer was kind of will be focused, you know, uh, 100 words away or 200 words away. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so now just to summarize this hasty tour of embeddings, uh, embeddings from the neural network models uh, depend on the distributional hypothesis. Uh, they're trained entirely on word code occurrence patterns. You know, you can talk about semantics, but, uh, you know, they do not know whether there was a lion there or a tiger, right? They do not know whether you meant to say, uh, you know, five or six. Uh, it's all the word distributions. Uh, they combine uh, syntactic and topical effects, and uh, they give us this high dimensional semantic space, uh, which allows us to use cosine and similarity to um, find things that are similar or dissimilar um, according to the lights of the model. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some uh, applications. So uh, as I said, uh, a bird is just trained on one big data set. It has no variation across time and space. Uh, so we can already see from the first part of the talk uh, that that's kind of a problem. You know, it's, it's in terms of being uh, ecologically valid or incisive, it's, it's a problem. 
so how do we handle all this? Uh, well, we could uh, just train a whole model from scratch. Um, and people have done that when there's a huge amount of data available. For example, the biomedical literature, um, they did try train up an entire uh, version of BERT on, a, on a, you know, billions of words of, of biomedical publications. Uh, but for most of your um, social data science applications, that's uh, totally impossible. There just will never be that much data uh, because if you got that much data, uh, you would be including people who were fundamentally different or you would be uh, including times when the, the situation had changed. So it's impossible. Uh, so now a uh, uh, typical approach nowadays would be to start with a pretend model. I know we're using BERT. Uh, and then uh, a standard approach is just that you adapt or fine tune the model to uh, data from different social groups uh, or else you adapt or fine tune the model to data from different times. Lots of people are doing that. I'll give you a few easy examples. Um, and then um, a more advanced approach, and I will be getting to that at the end, uh, would be that you um, use a network to represent your relations amongst people. So now you have this big graph of all the people. Um, and you make predictions on that, also using the language, using a graph neural network. Um, or you take into account the fact that the network uh, is actually changing over time. You know, your network is changing over time. Uh, and now we're uh, going to be using word type trajectories uh, influenced by the network and the time, and then contextualize them using a pre-trained language model. Uh, so this, this um, paper I picked because uh, uh, it was done as a um, uh, undergraduate fourth year project, a super student, Felix Drinkle, uh, and he was interested in using a, a social media data to forecast COVID caseloads. Uh, so, uh, and as you see, it was uh, published in a very excellent venue. Uh, so um, uh, basically we're gonna take our regional coronavirus Reddit. So these are now labeled by the social group or region, uh, for example, Washington. Um, and um, we're gonna cut off the Reddit data at some date. Um, let's say it was December 31st for you know one positioning of our window. And now we're gonna say, does that contain information about what the COVID caseload will be two weeks later? And that's an actual number that you could get from um, Johns Hopkins. Okay, so this is done uh, by um, uh, using a um, um, well-known, successful, unsupervised clustering algorithm, HDB scan, um, to uh, uh, cluster the posts and tune out, uh, you know, basically disregard uh, posts that are um, not relevant to the prediction task. Um, and uh, I guess I should say this is a, a standard setup where you're you're tuning a, a hyperparameter, but you're then testing on held out test data. So we're not just fitting here; we're, we're tuning our our our, uh, our clustering algorithm and then testing on our held out test data. Uh, okay, so now uh, here we have uh, all this um, uh, all these posts uh, from uh, Washington, uh, and we have some colored regions that were. Uh, clusters that were determined to be relevant to the prediction task. Um, and in Washington, one of those uh, clusters uh, has around the concepts of quarantine, where, which was much discussed when, you know, Washington was the state that got hit first. Uh, but in Florida, we know we're on the same algorithm, no hand tailoring, nothing, okay, okay, a different time, we get a very uh, predictive cluster associated with spring break. Right, because all these people uh, converged for spring break and went wild. Okay, now let's look at a temporal variation. Um, so obviously, um, representations are, um, in a month like BERT, depend on the distributions of topics and the materials they were trained on. And a big problem then uh, is that they um, deteriorate over time. 
on Google DeepMind has a whole team working on this. They always get worse over time. Well, why would that be? Uh, because uh, there are events in the world, exogenous factors is a fancy word for that, <laughs> that were not foreseen in the change what people talk about. So whatever distribution of topics you had up to 20, whatever, um, you know, now we are some years later, it, it's not correct. Um, so here we I just looked systematically uh, looked at temporal adaptation and fine tuning of BERT uh, for the original training task um, and also for um, text classification. Uh, so um, the paper looks at two tasks. One is mass language modeling. So that's predicting the word that you had. The other is a um, five-way document classification on politics subreddits. What's the political point of view? Uh, we have a, a variation in the domain and we have variation over time. We're starting with our pre-trained model. Um, adaptation means that we just continue unsupervised training with relevant data. Here, the relevant data was taken from a, a general news feed for the same time, not from any of our test um, reddits. Uh, fine tuning means that we um, uh, have uh, label data, namely which subreddit came to, came from, and we're uh, fine tuning for the classification task. So I'm just going to show you. Um, this is again just part of the results. But let's look at mass language modeling according to the temporal distance between the training and the test materials. Um, and um, the measure here is pseudo perplexity, which is a um, information theoretic measure of uncertainty about the masked word. So if your model's doing better, you expect that your prediction should be um, better, right? About which word was masked. Uh, so uh, that means that. Um, uh, negative numbers, an improvement in the, is an improvement in in um, in um, pseudo perplexity. You want to see that? That's in blue, and lo and behold, just as you would expect, uh, if you um, um, adapt on the correct time period, you do better. Okay, and if you adapt on the wrong time period, you do worse. Uh, but um, the really interesting thing about here is that we have a very a strong uh, temporal asymmetry uh, that uh, you train on an earlier time and test later uh, that you really take a hit because at the earlier time, no one foresaw events that would be discussed later. However, you train on a later time and test earlier, it's not quite so bad because uh, after something notable happens, people keep on talking about it. So that's exactly the same uh, asymmetry we saw with a recurrence time distribution. Uh, and then we did a backtrace on where the improvements were coming from. And um, uh, so you backtrace from their coding scheme to the words and then do part of speech tagging on the words. Uh, and uh, the uh, proper nouns, which are the burstiest words, I have a hugely disproportional effect on the improvement. Uh, and common nouns uh, have some sort of effect. And, uh, and for the other words, um, their uh, contribution to the improvement is much lower than their relative frequency. So basically, all of the improvements here are being uh, driven by um, uh, uh, tracking the changes in topic due to events, um, and uh, and uh, in particular, uh, keeping up on with the uh, bursts of what entities are being mentioned in discussing those events. Okay, okay. So now we're going on to a more advanced paper. Uh, so Valentin Hoffman, who's one of my DPhil students, uh, put together a um, data set which is distributed. It's open, anonymized. It uh, basically develop some criteria for a subreddit actually being about politics, not whether it was labeled as being about politics, but whether it was actually about politics. Uh, so that has a 605 subreddits that are de facto about politics. 
over six years. Um, and then we um, uh, define a social network based on whether um, two subreddits have disproportionately many users in common. The idea is that if you contribute to several subreddits and you're a single person, that would indicate some sort of relation between those subreddits. Uh, and that is defined using um, a statistical backboning technique to optimize the network. Um, and now we're trying to um, look at two questions. Um, obviously, politics is very uh, polarized. Uh, there's a ton of studies showing that uh, different political groups are sort of obsessed about different things. Uh, so salience, that's a salience. And uh, uh, that's where they're basically be uh, replicating a ton of work. Uh, the new part of this is framing. Uh, so both the left and the right um, during this time period, we're talking a whole bunch about gay marriage. Uh, but on the left, that tended to be discussed in relation to um, uh, civil rights, you know, freedom, liberty, equal protection under the law, uh, whereas on the right, it tended to be uh, discussed in relation to uh, moral purity and degeneracy. So that means we have the same topic, but it's being framed differently. Um, and that was um, defined by using a theory of moral foundations due to uh, hate et al, uh, or height. Um, the main author thinks it's universal, which is unlikely, but anyway, it's very well um, studied for English and there's whole lexicons of um, uh, a words norm for their projections onto these values as according to people, which we, we used. Um, and um, so then uh, the framing, we're getting that by projecting the bird embeddings onto the, uh, the moral foundations dimensions. Um, and now the uh, technical approach here is doing a link prediction on year-wise graphs. So that means we're going to, uh, we're assuming a sort of tivity that people you know, interact more with people who share their opinions. This is a very a common uh, assumption in the uh, social network literature. Uh, and we're trying to find the minimum number of concepts whose properties are maximally informative about the network structure, including both salience and fra framing. And that is being done uh, using a uh, graph autoencoder and a um, structured sparsity pruning algorithm. So here's just some visualization of what you get out of this. Um, a fascist is this fascism is discussed much more on the left. We've got this little um, a bunch of blue uh, nodes that discuss fascism more. They just do. Uh, uh, the word uh, mainstream is used by both sides, uh, but. Uh, on the right, mainstream is discussed uh, as related to moral degeneracy. That is the mainstream is deemed to be morally degenerate and that's showing up here. Um, or you can even track the ideological movement of entire subreddits this way. Uh, so here we have uh, a um, uh, Sino, which was um, a Chinese one, uh, moved to a more left-wing position over time and um, the free speech and the politic uh, subreddits um, were originally rather moderate and uh, moved to the right, as you see the arrows going the other way. Okay, and finally, um, this is a, a, a sort of advertisement for this uh, 2021 paper uh, on sort of how to <laughs> put everything together. And seriously, there's a lot of, this is a really technically heavy paper. So just go read the paper. I hope you'll be inspired to do that. <laughs> but um, uh, now we're trying to have dynamic contextualized word embeddings, like put everything all together. Uh, we have networks from multiple sources. Uh, so archive, scientific abstracts, we define the network on the, um, the specific, uh, uh, some fields using author overlap, Reddit user overlap again, Chow has explicit trust relations, Yelp has friendship relations, 
And now we're going to look at mass language modeling. And also for the last two, you can, their sentiment um, uh, data available. Uh, so now we're going to, uh, we're not going to just slice stuff up. Time is modeled by an uh, Ornst and Muhlenbeck process, which is a, a Gaussian process that's very much used in financial math and stuff with a random walk prior that enforces some smoothness and changing over time. Okay. And we have our whole network set up. Okay, so now we have our words, uh, which are word types are mapped to dynamic type embeddings using the graph uh, and the time. And then it is contextualized and applied to the task. Um, and one thing we got was we did get better predictions for sentiment analysis. Um, and you also have the ability to uh, track a diffusion of word meanings through the networks. So for example, the word network itself uh, has a meaning that's associated with machine learning. But before that rose to the fore, it, you know, meant other things, you know, just a network like the telecommunications network, any old network. Okay, so, uh, and here I just blew up the before and after so that you would be able to um, uh, see this uh, clearly enough on the slide. So in 2013, we had a little constellation of the learning sense of network in CS, which is squares. There was very little use in math. Uh, but actually, physicists were already uh, uh, working on that. So we have a little constellation down here. In 2020, not only is a lot more of the subfields using that, but now it is uh, kind of encroached a lot into the math literature, which is in triangles. Okay, so now you see the beginning and the end. Uh, but using this method, we can uh, track very smoothly uh, this propagation through uh, over the years. Uh, so that is the, um, the advertisement for that. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for your attention. Do we have more questions? And uh, we can take questions on Zoom. The, uh, your audio will be heard in the room. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question or raise your hand and, and I can call on you, you can also type questions in the chat and I'll ask them for you. And of course, if you're in the room, feel free to raise your hand or uh, otherwise make your intentions clear. Yeah. Um, and the, the that graph with the pseudo perplexity. Yeah. Um, was that I didn't quite catch. Was that somehow related to the clustering um, that you were talking about before, or is? Uh, no, I was giving. Um, so where did you? Uh, so it's basically, I was talking about two different papers, uh, illustrating. I mean, these are results from my group, which illustrate the standard strategy. Okay. And the standard strategy is. We're worried about a social effect. So we just adapt or fine tune a model to deal with that social effect. People do that. Um, Felix did a great job of doing that, but people do that. Uh, the other thing is um, you're worried about time. Like there's a famous paper by Hamilton, 2016 about changes in word meanings over time. You slice up your data, you adapt and fine tune over time. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, one thing I liked about uh, this project of Paul's was that it was very systematic, which allowed us to get at a more, a different level of interpretation uh, from just um, taking time slices. Right, we can say, okay, what's really going on here? What, how does that relate to what we know about how text is generated? Uh, but that has no, um, uh, that has uh, no um, topic clustering. It's just, um, it's just uh, taking, uh, uh, cutting across time. Uh, and then, uh, okay, and then after that, the, with some efforts to, you know, uh, put things together. Yeah. So when you get that final model where you can track words through sort of 
the literature. Um, is that, I know you showed one example, but if we were just like picked random like trends, could we just like plug it into your model and like see how it grows through time through like different researchers? Could you track oh, yeah. like- Oh yeah, I mean, you, so for the one thing is, um, okay, I mean, every, every bit of work has some limitations. Uh, so um, uh, it is designed so you could just yank out bird and put in something else. Um, and I think uh, it's it's actually already a rather well cited paper. I'm sure some of the papers citing it did replace Burke with something that's more up to date. Now it does have this um, uh, limitation that the um, It, it ends up treating the uh, semantic change as a change in the uh, balance of different senses of a word, which already existed in your contextualizer, mm -hmm. right? Um, because this uh, whole um, uh, using the network and the um, and the time variation that's done on word types, right? So it takes your word type and gets this nice dynamic vector. Okay, and now we're gonna spray that out uh, over all the uh, different contexts using BERT. So um, that means that it's not going to uh, succeed if some totally new meaning is coming up, right? So that would be the limitation of this, I think. Um, but as long but as, it, I mean, but as still, I, I was, I, I still think it, it, it was quite a big step forward, and it ends up, uh, uh, you know, uh, pushing around uh, uh, very uh, high dimensional vectors. I think there's 768 dimensions uh, once you've got all this information in there, uh, and it's not, uh, you know, the next step that would uh, allow for uh, new meetings to to just you know fade in and sort of become. Uh, clusters in their own right or something. Uh, it's not clear to me how to do that without um, uh, getting the um, number of um, parameters of the model totally out of control. But maybe the time will come when we can do it. <laughs> or we can just borrow you know, Google or Microsoft's compute power and then we'll do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm asked over and over again about uh, uh, why people in this field should work in academics at all, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm just not seeing the same level of interpretability coming out of out of uh, out of like DeepMind uh, as uh, as uh, you know academics who are very determined to uh, link things up with what they've learned about cognitive mechanisms or or linguistic theory or whatever. So that's one thing is the interpretability. Uh, and the other uh, big, uh, I mean, during the heyday of, of, of hidden Markov models, um, you know, the models were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they were kind of um, asymptoting out below where you really wanted to be. Uh, and I think that's happening with some of the, uh, deep learning models, people need to just rethink whether the, uh, I mean, I, I know ways in which the transformer architecture absolutely does not include things that we know about language. Uh, so there's got to be some, um, you know, like the, these attentional layers, they don't actually handle recursion. Uh, you know, if you have exactly the same relation uh, and you just stuff random stuff in the middle, which is, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 words long, but it's still the same relation from a dependency parser point of view. Uh, the big transformer models would have, to, would have to pick that up on different layers. They have no way of making a generalization that basically says, well, there was this recursive node in here that got, uh, you know, elaborated to varying amounts. Mm -hmm. So. Like, was it in the footnote or in the main text would like potentially confuse it if it was just parsing through the main text kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, in the in the footnote of the main text, but even even, uh, you know, I, I um, 
uh, so uh, my brother gave me a book, right? My brother who lives in Paris gave me a book. My brother who lives in Paris, and unfortunately I haven't been able to see him uh, during the entire COVID lockdown. Well, he gave me a book, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. So um, taking this, this question about like, why do this work in academia at all? Uh, maybe a little, um, one level more uh, nuanced, I guess, is um, do you then see a fruitful, like what do you see as the right mode of collaboration between industry and academia on this? You know, is it enough to just wait for the public outputs, uh, you know, until something's released and, and then do the academic work um, and then hope that the industry sort of picks it up so that their significant data resources and computational resources will eventually impact it? Or do you see a mode for sort of a more ongoing collaboration where each side sort of brings its its particular resources and expertise to move things forward faster or farther? Well, I, I think there, so I, I mean, I did work at Bell Labs. I think that was very valuable. And, and uh, uh, Valentin Hoffman is, you know, one of these DFL students, he did a, a five month uh, internship at Google DeepMind. And I think it was very valuable. Um, so, I mean, you definitely get a, a perspective from working in industry uh, about, um, I don't know, kind of hitting the bottom line and not being overly theoretically influenced about what the main problem is, you know, because maybe some famous professor, you know, is stuck on some what he thinks is the primary problem, but when you look at, at what people actually do in um, spontaneous language, uh, it's going to affect uh, natural language processing system. It's absolutely not that at all. Uh, so I, I, I think that that's very valuable. Um, I, um, it's uh, uh, tricky because of the um, extremely heavy use of non-disclosure agreements in industry. Um, I think uh, sometimes they're, um, you know, keeping stuff undisclosed that um, well, I, I guess it's the same thing in the defense sector, just classifying too much, you know, they, 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 uh, you know, hope it might make money some time later, but meanwhile, they're just not getting the kind of the criticism they would get from having it out in the open. Um, and also, um, some of their uh, goals would only be uh, shared with um, academics to a point, right? Uh, I mean, you take, um, you know, things like um, um, helping out um, the tools for moderators so that they can uh, identify and take down hate speech, right? So of course, uh, you know, Facebook would like to have better tools for moderators, um, and uh, and um, so that they don't get um, you know compromise their business reputation, get sued or whatever. Uh, but they want that, but they don't want that so much that they're going to undermine their profits. And, and in some cases, it's really up to academics to uh, to um, figure out where the public good is and pursue them public good. Um, and one place where that's especially true is um, is building um, much smaller, lighter systems for under-resourced languages. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to, uh, um, you know, uh, promote uh, female literacy in Pakistan, uh, and we're at this point of, uh, of trying to even get font and keyboarding standards for some of the languages that are spoken in Pakistan. This is not, this is important, but it's not um, going to be a top priority for most of the, most companies. Any questions on the Zoom? Um, so we've determined that deviation words and its frequencies can be utilized to exact which concept is being discussed. How would you trace certain topics and ideas when they're cryptic and use certain obscure languages, especially if it poses a threat to security? Um, I feel like I missed a few words. Uh, um, so you said something about obscure languages and you said something about tracing topics. Yeah, and I said, how would you trace certain topics and ideas when they're cryptic, when there's cryptic language? When they're cryptic? 
Yeah. Uh, so that would be where, um, oh, well, so uh, one uh, case that comes to mind is when people are uh, trying to um, circumvent uh, censorship, for example, they might um, uh, develop some sort of a convention in which maybe some um, name of some cartoon character stands for some a topic or problem. Would that be a case of a cryptic, uh, langu cryptic language? Or do you mean more like a Twitter where people are just as being as speaking as short, you know, using as short a message as possible? Um, I, I think the first example you used is, but is what I was imagining. Um, when there's so like that words is very, that, that is, is a very uh, that is very uh, challenging and um, and um, I mean. To some extent, you would be able to uh, make that connection if um, you know some name uh, suddenly disappears uh, from the online discourse, and a different one is coming up in similar contexts. You you would probably uh, at least be able to hypothesize that connection, uh, but um, in many cases, uh, that would um, exceed the power of current natural language technology um, because uh, people are using multi-step reasoning to make that association, uh, possibly involving some uh, world knowledge. Um, and uh, particularly if uh, the people using that expression share world knowledge that is not um, widely shared, they might be making steps in reasoning that, uh, that uh, really the current technology would not follow. Um, so, uh, I mean, you, you can even think if you're, um, uh, I don't know, you, you have a, 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 a partner and you're, and you're, uh, and you're, and you're texting about where to meet up and, and you just, uh, a text at the usual place, 5 p.m., right? You know, and they know what the usual place is to be at 5 p.m., but uh, other people getting that message might not know. So I, I think you, you're, you're relating on something that is, is um, really very challenging for current technology. Thank you. All right, I think that concludes our time then. Uh, thank you again to uh, Dr. Pierre Humbert, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.